Good morning, Tallahassee. It's time to wake up War Chant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Here's WarChant.com's Aslan Hajavandi and Corey Clark. Wake up! Wake up, everyone. Wake up. It's Monday. That's Corey. I'm Aslan. Welcome to the program. It's Wake Up War Chant brought to you by For the Table Hospitality and their three awesome locations over in the College Town District, Madison Social, Central, and Township. Hopefully you checked them out over the weekend. It was a Garnet and Gold Spring Football Weekend, man. Remember what we talked about last week? Things don't live up to the hype, Corey, often in this world of ours. Right. Everybody wants to be ahead of the curve. I saw the coolest thing. This is the best thing ever. Best player ever. Best game ever. Best spring game ever. Did it happen? Did we experience it? Did we witness it? Did we watch it? Did we feel it? It's hard to say because I haven't been to all of them, but it was easily the coolest of the 10, 10 or 11 that I've I've seen, um, even eclipsing what Jameis did, um, just because that was kind of about one guy, the Jameis game. It, it, it was incredible what he did, and it, it gave the, the program a sense of, uh, you know, a rejuvenation just with this. Is this going to be the guy? But this one was about. It just seemed like it was about a everything, a program, with with all the with Bowden in the corner, just shaking hands with the players, and Taggart doing his victory lap and laughing at Odell's seminal rap yeah. in the middle of the. Um, it just it felt like a perfect way to start an era, for a for a fan base that was ready to start a new era. You, I mean, it's not an accident that those sixty one thousand people showed up for a spring game for a coach that didn't beg people to come. They they want to be a part of this. They feel a connection to this guy that the you know they didn't with the previous guy. And it and it you you can tell how excited the fan base is. I was I was stunned by the crowd. Stunned. I don't know why. I shouldn't have been. I guess, but I was genuinely stunned by the crowd. Well, let's not give Taggart too much credit. Salt and Peppa, Rob True. Bass, Vanilla Ice were out there as well doing their and thing. And the the tur- turtle was on the stage dancing with him. Michelangelo was dancing with him. So yeah, it was a it was a. Uh, a pretty remarkable Saturday night. No, it was like a it was a music festival. It was like a carnival atmosphere, yeah, but not was. in a bad way though. Not yeah. in a bad way. It was it it just felt the it was vibe, more than a energy. football game. It yeah. was an event. It was a production. It was come back, everyone come home. It was like a homecoming in the middle of of the spring almost. Everybody came back to see the new guy and I mean pretty much everything that's been thrown his direction, man. He's he's put the barrel on the ball, man. He's just been he's been doing great. I mean, it was Dion's out there. He's I mean, Dion's Talking to him like they're best friends, and they're pointing things out in the crowd and laughing and joking. And then Bobby Bowden shows up, and everybody rises to their feet. Willie runs across the field. I mean, Willie was over on the opposing like thirty yard line getting ready for player intros. Bobby gets off in the golf cart in the south end zone, north end zone, north end zone, and then you know gets out of his golf cart. Willie walks out there, puts his arms around him, and just everything, everything. There was a moment where. Uh... You might have heard it. I can't remember if you were sitting between us or not. When they played Baby Got Back on the on the PA. Oh, yeah. And then DJ Matthews and Brian Burns started dancing right next to each other. Right before, you know, probably 30 seconds before a play. It was like a TV timeout or whatever they call those. DJ or, Matthews going to snatch your girl, man. Yeah. So he he's dances. he's dancing next to Burns, and they're just going back and forth dancing. The whole crowd is dancing. Um, and then Ira said something like, "What what is going on? What is this? It just It's so foreign to what we've had here for so long. To see them having that kind of fun, uh, an offensive player and a defensive player dancing with each other. And then, you know, I know maybe some people are like, well, I don't want my guys having that much fun. It's football. Let's take it serious. Three plays later, DJ Matthews had a 71-yard catch. So you're allowed to dance and then still take it seriously once the whistle blows. I mean, I just, it was that vibe that's really, unless you were in the stadium, you, it's hard. It's one of those things that's kind of hard to explain, but it was just, it, it was different. It just felt different. It was more fun than most games have been here the last three or four years. Honestly, home games. The attendance was really robust too, man. Yeah. Sorry about everybody that waiting in line. Again, yeah, we that had nothing to sucks. do with that. That didn't kind of suck. I, I, you know, I, I know they weren't. They just couldn't have. They just couldn't have expected that. Nobody expected that kind of rush. Maybe they should have had a few more on hand just in case. Because you're asking people to come. You want them to come. Maybe prepare as if they might come. <laughs> well, I think then they they pre sold. What twenty something thousand? I think 29? they knew. I the last I saw, Jim Henry from the Democrat had tweeted out that they had sold thirty four thousand tickets as of late Friday night, Saturday morning. That doesn't count college kids, and it doesn't count walk ups. And I but think you they, knew you were going to get some walk ups. I think 
I mean, we talked about we had to sit on our over under. I mean, I was like, oh, there'll be a whole bunch of walk ups because I think a spring game doesn't lend itself to pre buying, pre purchasing yeah. tickets. It must have been. I mean, I don't, not counting the students, the students were probably seven thousand. There must have been another fifteen, twenty thousand walk ups on Saturday, which is a huge number. But still, they should have been better prepared. It, it, we, you know, Ira took that picture at six thirty four. I, I don't want to make this a complaint about Florida State because it was a really great night. But I just felt bad for those fans that that missed the first thirty, essentially missed the whole first quarter. And that was a fun stuff. And that was a it was a couple trick plays. I mean, it was a really neat. It was LeBorn's run. Um, the one know, with the big a hole, and when he just hit, it, yeah, hit and that he just, hit, he just hit it, just hit it. I mean, what else are you gonna do with it when you see it? You hit it. So I'm, I feel bad for those people that had to wait in line for that because that was that was kind of preposterous. They, and then finally, I think they decided to just say, "Hey, come on in." Come on in, everyone. We're opening up all the gates. Because, I mean, if you're going to stand in line for 35 minutes, you're not faking like you have a ticket. Yeah. You probably have one. I figured it was like a security up. thing. Maybe they were searching they, they, bags or something. Apparently they didn't care about security after yeah. the first quarter. Like, come on. Everyone loves Willie. No one's here to hurt anybody. It's, just, yeah. it's a party, man. Yeah, exactly right. But then you mentioned, I mean, right from the jump, you know, I, I think I got a little bit of guff from folks because I don't know if I, they thought I was being irrational or impractical with the expectations I had for the spring game because – I'm like, listen, if, if, if they're going to predicate things on being simple and easy, well, then they should go out there and, and make, not make it look easy, but at least get some stuff off where it's going to be clean, quick, I mean, and, and get give you a good expectation, a good idea of what it's going to look like so you can extrapolate and imagine what it's going to look like come Labor Day. And I mean, gosh, you're keeping tabs of it. Like in the first five minutes, the, the amount of things that happened that would have never happened under the previous regime. It was well, incredible. Yeah, Tamori and Terry was on a field making plays. That didn't happen. Uh, you had, I think, at least three plays where the ball was snapped with 30 on the play clock, 31, 32, something like that. Um, you had a trick play. You went for it on fourth down in your own territory. Yeah, things like that just didn't happen. And that was literally in the first 10 minutes of the uh, of the game. It's just, you know, in again, it's hard to judge spring games because of a lot of reasons that we've gone into multiple times. And it was ugly at times. They're all going to be ugly at mm-hmm. times. But I feel like the the pretty really outweighed the ugly. And Terry and DJ Matthews are at the forefront there, along with LeBourne and the defensive line. I think those four things, four, three people and then a whole segment group, uh, should really excite Florida State fans for what they saw. I think it worked out really well because it was a, a competitive first half. I mean, they were they were all in really competing hard in the first half. And then the second half, it was like, okay, you know, let's just get this over with. Let's go off on a high note. First half was really exciting. Just get that clock running and... We everybody got out of there without anybody else getting hurt. So, I mean, I was I was impressed with the way things worked out. My kind of thing is, and you you were joking about it. You're telling me Ira and I because you know we're sitting there. I'm I'm editing a video. Ira's uh, typing out play by play stuff, and we keep missing plays. I mean, yes. like you know, like guys, you can't you can't do this anymore. Because I'm like I can't see what's going well, no, on. No, it was the play where uh, Terry took or not Terry Matthews took DJ Matthews took the end around, did a spinny do, came back the other way and threw a pass to Terry downfield, and Terry ended up scoring. But it didn't count because he'd been two hand touch at like the thirty five yard line or something because they weren't tackling in the second half. Right. And Ira looked up and said, "Was that Terry that scored that?" And I go, "Yeah." And it was DJ that threw it. And he goes, "What?" And I go, "Dude, you better keep your head up, man. This ain't you. You don't get thirty two seconds to tweet now oh. between plays. You better you better keep your head on a swivel because you look down to tweet something. I think he was actually working on a story. Yeah. But you're writing a story. You don't get." One play's done. You don't get 26 seconds to look up to see what's going on and see the quarterback point to a linebacker and point up here, right. point out the safety. The linemen are pointing all over the place. Running Receivers are running over. I mean, it's it's snap it and go. Get tackled, line up, snap it again. And we all got to get used to that. The yeah. band has to get used to that. Right. So you were you had a good eye on things. I was, I, I was admittedly distracted for the first, you know, quarter and a half of the game, but I actually went back Sunday and watched the first half again Thanks to Cinefunk doing yeoman's work out there. See Funk. Because the the ESPN, I have ESPN. I do have cable, so I can access that stuff. But it's the, the player is very clunky. You can't scrub through video and yeah. rewind quickly and easily. But on YouTube, you obviously can. So Cinefunk does. Those guys, all those guys. Yeah. We've said Mandarin it before. Noel, yeah. Mandarin Noel, who actually messaged us. He did. That was a really nice yeah. message. Appreciate I hope it, he gets man. back in the game. I hope you get back in the game, Mandarin Noel. Yeah, man. We need, um, but, we, yeah, that, that, that stuff is invaluable, especially during the season, those people that do that. But, but what did you see? What were your well, takeaways? My thing is that it's like I, I don't – I've always been – because you would hear coaches, i got to look at the film and – and I'm not saying that I'm looking at the film anywhere near the way that coaches do, but it's how do you kind of divorce yourself from what you saw live and then when you go back and look, because it's different, because then you start factoring in things, you're able to kind of go back and look at it a few more times. Um, and, and that's why I think, you know, the offensive line, I think is instantly getting kind of 
smashed or not smashed, but people are a little bit, oh, geez, you know, everything looked good, but what about the offensive line? Um, I saw a lot of things that, that were encouraging. Um, let's talk about that next when we come right back on Wake Up War Chant here on ESPN 979 Tallahassee. You're locked in to Wake Up War Chant on 979 ESPN Radio. My dear, my dear, my dear, you do not know me, but I know you very well. Now let me tell you that I can't, 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 can't you My dear, my dear, my dear, you do not know me, but I know you very well. Now let me tell you that I can't, you I look up with a lot. What's going on, everybody? I'm Aslan. He's Corey. It's Wake Up War Chant. It's brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. Three locations over in College Town. Go ahead, check them on out. All right, course. so that was my uh, my query to the masses before we went to break there is that it's, it's weird. I've always wondered, you know, do you trust what you see on Saturday evening under the lights or do you trust what you see Sunday morning when you watch the film? But, you know, I guess we'll, we'll probably go back and forth on this because you saw things more so in, 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 real, in real time. But there's a lot of guys that flashed defensively. Offensively, I want to kind of get to that first. Poor Josh Ball. I think Josh Ball probably played like 85% of the offensive oh, snap for, for both, both, both teams. Sides, yeah. So, and he had a couple moments that didn't look the best, but he was, I mean, he was the one guy I think that, that consistently played for both sides. I think Derek Kelly like stayed at home with his team. Landon Dickerson stayed with the Garnet team uh, by and large. So I feel like they'll get the best five. Ultimately, I feel Greg Fry's got them in the right direction because when I, when there were breakdowns, it, it wasn't a lot of confusion. There was some of that stuff. There was a there was a play. I think you know, I don't want to pile on him because he, he's probably he might be starting. You know, Josh Ball, Adonis Thomas showed blitz coming off the corner. You know, first step for Josh Ball was actually he was facing up and getting ready to to block Adonis Thomas, but then he just kind of turns back to the inside. There was nobody for him to block. Adonis right. Thomas comes around and and gets his hand on for a sack. So, uh, but that was few and far between. The guys were getting off the ball well. There was a lot of pulling. And guys were getting to the right spots and getting their hands on guys, so that was encouraging to me. There wasn't there wasn't a lot of confusion. There was there was good like good movement off the ball. Guys getting to the next level, getting hats on hats. The moments where they did struggle by and large were when they didn't have enough guys back there to protect in terms of the blitz that was coming. They didn't have enough hats. They only had five guys in protection, and the defense rushed six or seven. So that's when they face a lot of their problems. So I can live with that sort of stuff because I don't know how much they're really expecting the opposing team to blitz in a spring game. But it was cool to see that sort of stuff. So I think the offensive line will be okay because I think there's enough talent out of all those guys to find five really good players. Plus, Alec Eberly, for whatever sort of maligned you know reputation he has within this fan base, I think he's very respected by his teammates. And he hasn't been out there, and I think he's probably an upgrade over anybody else that's going to be snapping the ball, that was snapping the ball to Bailey and, and James over the over the Saturday weekend game. Yeah, he's a big deal. He's That's a big – I mean, you, you're missing your – is he a two-year starter at center? I think. Sounds about right now. Yeah. Um, you, you're missing that guy, and that's a big deal to to be uh, trying to break in somebody new that hasn't really played a whole lot. Eberle is a step up, and uh, you know I, I think they're missing the other kid at tackle that's that, that they think will probably start too. Jawan Williams, yeah. yeah. So you know that's concerning though. It's a shoulder again. And that's yeah, what sidelined that, him last with lineman, year. Man, that's a, that's like a baseball pitcher having a shoulder issue. Man, yeah. you, you're always worried about those. But yeah, I I get it. I mean, I look the Florida State defensive line is pretty good. They're missing some guys too, but they couldn't block Demarcus Christmas, which they're not supposed to be able to block Demarcus Christmas. He's a senior and he's good and he's an NFL player. You 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 know he's supposed to dominate like he did. I thought the linebackers had some nice moments. They did. Uh, Leonard Warner had a nice jump up pass break. Dontavis Jackson triggered a few times. He made a and nice play. Decalin, uh, uh, Decalin, I think had seven tackles. Yep. Uh, play, made some plays in space in the first half. Uh, some of those guys did, and would be was all over Nine the field. Tackles, yeah, he was, and I think he had a sack or almost had a sack. He certainly forced an early throw. That guy can really run and uh, didn't shy away from anything, which is good to see, man. You, you, again, you've been on campus for three, four months. Should be in high school. Wasn't afraid of the moment at all. You know, it was surprising. He had a good game. I thought was Trey Lawson. And man, you want to talk about people keep you, you know feel like he's at least a year away with yeah. that body. You keep picking everyone keeps picking on James Blackman for being thin, and it's yeah. like man, Trey Lawson is is almost in a, in a war sort of situation. But I never saw him get manhandled. He's super quick off the ball, so it's not like he's just rail thin and doesn't have the the redeeming factor of being quick off the ball. But I mean, I saw him. He's got a really good spin move. He was able to get you know break the pocket and and, and collapse things. So I was very surprised by that because that's one of the guys I looked at. I was like, dang. Uh, he redshirted last year, and he still looks like this. But, he, you know, he, there was only maybe one or two plays. I think I think Derek Kelly got on him one time. We are like, well, dang, that's going to be a problem being that small. But otherwise really held his own. So 
was impressed by kind of his effort. So, you know, that's a guy that I think we heard a lot of buzz about when he was a recruit. That listen, he'll, he'll be a good player. He's just got to get his body right. So right, I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, you're a noted, uh, and I, I'm not going to even paint you in that with this broad brush that you were painted in early. It's been months now. But you were a noted Jimbo defender when you got here, right. quote unquote. Yeah. Uh, those are other people's words, not mine. Um, and you're a Florida State fan. You grew up right. a Florida State fan. You've been cheering for them forever. I'm an alumnus. Does it an alumnus? Does it make you angry when you watch what Terry and Matthews did on Saturday? I don't want to. I don't want to steal the fire from you, man, because that's going to be a good column in, in a month and a half, two months when it's going to be sleepy oh, times. It might, be, it might be two days from now. <laughs> it might be two hours. As soon as I'm out of here, I might write that column. But I'm legitimately asking you: when you watch that kid, number fifteen, run the way he ran and make the plays he made. What in the world was going on last year? You know what makes me – this is what makes me upset. For so long, you, there was a guy that was on the boards called War Paint, and his whole thing was that players play, coach, coaches coach. It's, it's always about the players' lack of execution that, that causes losses, right? And there's always people that do the whole, I trust the coaches, and Jimbo I trust. Well, there's validity to that, too, in some most instances, sure. Well, so you're like, okay, and there's, always, there's this great clip that always replays in my head. It was during, I think, the 1983 NFL draft where – the Jets could have drafted Dan Marino, and they didn't. And they interviewed a, a a Jets fan at the draft, and he's like, you know, everybody thought Marino was there. The Jets were going to take him. But at the end of the day, you got to trust the Jets, and you got to trust the coach. They know what they're doing. Yeah. So you don't see Tamori and Terry on the field. I think they drafted Richard Todd, maybe, instead, another quarterback. They, no, Ken O'Brien, I think, was that oh, guy. Oh, yeah, maybe. yeah, that's Ken right. O'Brien. That's right. Good call. So I think. Not Dan Marino. Yeah, not Dan Marino. <laughs> right. So, you know, my whole thing is you're, I'm, I'm quote, trusting in Jimbo because I've seen what he's done over the long haul. And I'm like, okay, well, there's, there's got to be a reason why these guys aren't out there playing. I always think that, trust too. Him. And what then you're like, what were you thinking, could man? There be? What were you thinking? Because it's like, okay, I get it. He doesn't know all the plays. Put, a, put your finger in the dirt and say, hey, man, here's your finger. Here's the end zone. I'm, you do this and just go straight yeah. down the dirt till you get to the end zone. Yeah. I mean, at some point, you have a freakish talent. And I, and I talked to Brian Burns yeah. after the game and uh, asked him about it. I said, hey, man, did you know, was was to, was Tamori and Terry like this last year? Did you know he was this? And he goes, yes. That's exactly how he toned it, too. Oh, I mean, I was there. Yes. I was there. He was <laughs> emphatic about it. Yes. And you're like, well, this guy's a defensive end, and he knows. And then the head coach offensive guru guy's like, oh, he's not ready. He's not ready. And he's like, yes. And Willie said, Willie Taggart said in his postgame press conference that he knew – he watched the bowl practices because that's when he obviously he first took over. He wasn't he hadn't taken over, but he was on campus. And he said Terry was standing out then. He's like, that's when I first knew about him was was watching him dominate practices. And it just it, it's I mean, he could have made a difference. Maybe you win the Louisville game or the Miami game if you have another guy that can just go make one play, a fifty yard catch, yeah. instead of throwing it to to walk ons. It it boggles the mind when it you does. see that kind of talent. And LeBorn, too, to be honest with you. I mean, I think there was a game that Patrick missed that was injured. He, Patrick was kind of banged up. Yep, You're telling was. me that guy couldn't have helped you last year, maybe win a game or two? And the, the, the thing that bothers me, if well, it just bothers me, and I'm not, quote, unquote, a Florida State fan, there is no chance that Terry and LeBorn are going to be here for five years. Yeah. Zero. They are not going to be here in 2022. So what was last year? Well, you can break them before you make them. Maybe, maybe mentally they're not ready. No, I mean, I don't even know. if you don't, yeah. even if you think they can only play four snaps a game, or only they play against Louisiana Monroe, whatever it is, what was the point of redshirting them? Get them experience because they are too talented to be here for five years. It's just not going to happen. That guy, I, I just couldn't. I can't. I was stunned. The most jaw dropping play of that entire game was LeBourne's ninety one yard run, and it wasn't because of what he did. Because yes, it we was. all know he hit it. We Dude. all know he hit it and he hit Did it hard. Did you see the cut the re- he made? My is goodness. ridiculous. My goodness. That's I'm a camp cam makers of my boy. Uh, yeah, I'm yeah, a little bit worried. Yeah. A little bit nervous, <laughs> yeah. Cam. Somebody's <laughs> breathing down your neck. A little bit nervous, Cam. But watching Terry hawk him down to try. I mean, he wasn't trying to tackle him, obviously. He was trying to get out ahead of him to block. Watching him hit full gear. I mean, because he was at a standstill. If you watch it, he's at a standstill at like the 10. Not No momentum at all. Sees LeBorn break free and then hits it. And by midfield, that's one of the fastest Florida State players I've ever seen. It was incredible to watch. Yeah. So, again, I, I know he's not as good as Jared Jackson or Justin Motley or those guys, but I think he has Motlow. a chance. Motlow, sorry. Uh, which, actually, by the way, Motlow was a great story, catching that pass, the yeah. first Seminole Tribe member to do that. But 
it, it boggles the mind and is really kind of frustrating that, that, that those kids could not see the field last year. And I thought you actually pulled out a really good uh, professional reference or a comparison to LeBorn, and that is Larry Zonk, obviously. They, they share a lot of similar traits. That was really good. Yeah, don't you think? Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, sim- yeah. yeah, exactly right. No, actually, Corey called in the press box. He said Le'Veon Bell. And when I, and I'm like, okay, but then when I went back and saw that run, because Le'Veon Bell does all that jump, cut, step nonsense. It's not as uh, extreme as Le'Veon yeah. Bell, but he's really My patient behind goodness. the line. And then when he sees it, he goes. But he's really patient, kind of dancing back there a little bit before he sees something to run through. Yeah. And he's got obviously got a lot of Zonka yeah. and some Rigo, a little John Riggins yeah. in there too. Yeah. All right, so maybe Cam Akers has got somebody breathing down his throat. What's I think it? Cam Akers might have to transfer. <laughs> well, wait, I know Zaquandre Wright might be the guy that's going to transfer. It's going <laughs> well, to be Cam Akers at yeah. least. Um, but the quarterback situation, something that we need to talk about because I think we all thought that James Blackman was, you know, head and shoulders the guy going into the game. And how much does one game change our opinion on that? We'll talk about that later. But when we come back, we're going to get Michael Langston on the horn because a lot of great things happened for Florida State this weekend on the field, uh, but also off the field in terms of recruiting. We'll get the latest on that from Michael right after this. It's Wake Up Or Channel on ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee. The excitement of the Willie Taggart era at Florida State is in full force. That's why now's the perfect time to sign up at Warchant.com. Warchant Warchant.com will have wall-to-wall coverage of spring football practice, including the latest on position battles, coach and player interviews, video features, and in-depth analysis. Warchant.com's three team writers, Gene Williams, Ira Chauffel, and Corey Clark, have 50 years of experience covering the Seminoles. And Warchant.com is the only FSU media outlet with a dedicated, full-time recruiting analyst in Tallahassee with the latest on the 2019 class. For your 30-day free trial subscription, head to Warchant.com and use promo code WARCHANT30. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Aslan. He's Corey Clark. It's Wake Up Orchant right here on ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee, brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. Uh, there was great hospitality over at the um, Champions Club before the game, Corey. We got to hang out up there, you, myself, as well as our guest on the phone right now, Michael Langston. Got to meet a lot of the fans and a lot of the subscribers from Orchant. That was super cool. That was a lot of fun, yeah. People were actually really complimentary of you. Eh, a few. Well, everybody that I talked to was complimentary. Yeah, that no, was cool. Man. It was super cool. And everybody was uh, really... Uh, I didn't mean to say that as if it was a surprise. No, I got you. <laughs> uh, everybody was really dialed in though, to hear what uh, Michael Langston had to share. Michael Langston was doing double duty out there uh, trying to, to meet the masses, but also working very uh, arduously because there was guys committing left and right. It felt like, Michael. That was a that was a magical Saturday morning, it felt like, huh? Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty exciting. It was pretty challenging, but it was exciting and... Uh, wasn't expecting that. Uh, obviously, we had to do some shuffling here and there, but uh, you know, incredible, uh, incredible day. Obviously, uh, you talk about the meet and greet that was phenomenal. Just uh, meeting a lot of people, and uh, I don't get to sit around with you know Ira and Corey and Gene all the time. So just to hear you know them talk about the team, <laughs> I'm kind of learning stuff right. as they're sharing it because I'm not at practice a lot. So um, yeah, I think it was very informative and. Uh, I think everyone had a really good time there. For sure. So it all started off, I think, with Dante Lucas uh, committing big, I mean, uh, proverbially, literally and figuratively, big-time commit. He looks uh, like he's 36 years old. He's huge. He looks like we went to high school together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a, he's a mammoth kid. Uh, if you're ever around him, uh, you see him. We, we actually, uh, when we were doing the meet and greet, you know, we could, uh, you know, I could see him trying on the uniform on the field uh, from a long distance away, and you could still see how just mammoth this guy is. Uh, big time road grader guard. I mean, he's gonna he's gonna create a lot of paths as far as the running backs. And as we saw in the spring game, uh, FSU seems like they're gonna run the ball a lot, so that kind of guy is gonna fit perfectly to what FSU is gonna do. And I think uh, this one was it might shock some people. It was like the least. Uh, confidence I had as far as uh, him coming, but I still thought he would because there was so many connections with um, Tully Lockett and Willie Taggart, and I just felt when he got back on campus that uh, that he was gonna he was gonna pull the trigger and get it done. So getting him early that kind of solidified to me like okay, uh, all these other ones are gonna happen for sure. So, um, but that got the day started really well and um, got things cooking, and it just. It just kept going on throughout the day with a, a lot of excitement and even more commit. So, really good day. I think the next guy was Maurice Goolsby, a, a four-star wide receiver out of Denellen, 
Uh, that's mm-hmm. where Terrence Brooks, I think, actually is from. So, hey, right, yep. one of my all-time yep. favorite guys to cover Let's was that, Terrence Brooks. Get that pipeline. So this, this, this Goolsby guy, he's a player, right, Mike? He's very good. Um, he's a guy that you could play at wide receiver, or you could flex him out and play kind of the the way uh, FSU is going to use their tight ends. He could kind of play that position. He's basically like a big receiver, um, you know, type. Uh, so he he can get in there. He, he's a very big time weapon, especially inside the red zone. Uh, not blazing fast, but uh, a guy that gets off the jams really well as far as the line of scrimmage, and he's a very good, tough matchup, and he's going to bring a lot of uh, excitement. He's a Rivals 100-type kid, so another big-time weapon for them, that receiver, which, you know, before, you know, uh, with the previous staff, you sit there, man, sure hope they get a receiver. They sure need some receivers, and now they would tag her. It seems like uh, that's not an issue at all, and they're just getting receivers left and right, so... He's a big time uh, addition for FSU. He's a former Florida commit, so adding him is um, not only helping FSU but also you know hurting their their biggest rival. So I think it's a, a massive pickup on the offensive side of the ball. Recruiting analyst Michael Langston joining Corey Clark and myself right here on Wake Up War Chant. Defensively, uh, they added a, a piece as well. And you talk about big, big. I mean, everybody's big. I mean, uh, Dante Lucas, very large individual. Maury Schools, B six foot five. Jaleel McCray, uh, rivals has him listed at six two two oh five, and he's a cornerback. Uh, that's pretty yeah. intriguing. It sounds like Michael. Yeah, they got him listed as a corner, but he's actually going to be an outside linebacker. Uh, I've been working on them to kind of adjust his. Um, position they have on there, but he's in, he plays mainly just, outside just linebacker. Just change the L to the C, yeah. <laughs> or the C to the L, and we're done. We're done with yeah. it, Michael. Yeah, he's he's really fast. Uh, you know, outside linebacker can can hit like a tank, and he can certainly uh, you can put him in coverage, and you feel pretty comfortable with him out there. Um, he actually went to you know a couple of leg injuries, but you know he's perfectly healthy now, and um, he's ready to go. But he's a guy that. I was the most confident on because uh, I knew that um, from his first visit, he was basically just telling me, like, hey, I'm just waiting for them to tell me to, to go, <laughs> you know, when to do it. So I got the feeling that he was going to pop uh, certainly this weekend. And he also goes to IMG, uh, same as uh, Dante Lucas. So, you know, getting especially linebackers, I mean, Corey knows as well as I do just about how uh, that, that position has been pretty thin. So, you know, the last – two classes uh they're certainly uh you know filling that need you know the way that they need to and adding a guy like that is a uh, you know a big addition for you know harlan barnett and that defense michael you're on twitter a lot and obviously you're you're talking to these recruits and and seeing what they post and, and just talking to them on the phone or seeing them down on the field what was the vibe like saturday night for you and it, it, can you relate it to anything since you've been doing this i know you've been doing this for i don't know four decades but if you how <laughs> I, it, to me, it just seemed like just the energy, obviously the energy in the stadium, but even all the things you saw recruits tweeting uh, was something that maybe, you know, it's not like Florida State's ever struggled really recruiting, but it seems like, you know, this last four months crystallizing on Saturday night, it seems like Florida State has become the cool place to maybe go to go play yeah. football. Yeah, and, and fortunately, um, you know, this was really my first time actually seeing a full kind of, you know, scrimmage type or game type. And unfortunately as well, I was sitting actually not too far away from the recruits so I could watch kind of some of their reactions. And and uh, I've never seen recruits that excited, and I've never seen that much energy in that stadium. I'm born and raised in Tallahassee, so I've seen all kinds of, you know, coaches come through and just, you know, teams they've had and, I have never seen the excitement that I saw in uh, Duke Campbell, especially for a spring game. It was almost like a you know, regular season big game when, when you were there, just seeing the reaction of the fans, the energy in the stadium. It was it was quite electric, and and just all the recruits are just you know we'll, we'll cover a few of these in a few minutes, but they were just blown away by uh, just the energy they saw in there, and you know and. Um, the main thing is, like, we talk about all the impacts that, you know, coaches have with recruiting, but the FSU fans had a big impact in FSU having uh, a really successful weekend. Like, when kids see that stuff and they see the energy and it's like no other place they've been, that's the one thing I've heard from all the recruits is, like, this is, like, no place I've been. Like, I've, I've seen no excitement kind of to this level, so... I think the FSU fans deserve a lot of credit. They really uh, 
helped energize this weekend and keep um, you know, get the momentum going and 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 seeing the, the recruits seeing the, just the, the excitement level was uh, was big time because of the energy in the stadium. So, no, Corey, I have not seen anything like that. Make Florida State football fun again. They're uh, they're off to a really good start. Oh, we got about a minute left, Michael. There were some a uh, couple big fish that were in town. Kayvon Thibodeau, one of them, uh, as well as uh, was it Evan Neal, the big offensive lineman. Uh, how did those guys kind of size up their visit to Tallahassee and uh, the the Taggart era? Yeah, Thibodeau was really good. Um, I think uh, I think FSU is a, a big time player now. I think uh, if not the mo- the team that's most on his mind right now. Obviously, he's coming off a visit, but. They're very much a big player. Another guy in there uh, that we mentioned is Corvarius Crouch. He's actually the number one player in in the country, and, and we just did an update on him just recently. And, and I feel like FSU is now uh, a, a big time player there uh, at linebacker. I think FSU has uh, certainly uh, got a possibility to pull him off. And then the other guy is Evan Neal. FSU wasn't really they were in the you know kind of interest level was good, but. I think he was absolutely just stunned and blown away, and and now I think FSU is the team to you know, really watch here uh, you know, in that in his recruitment because he has good ties with Willie and um, the uh, the weekend in general. I mean, I've just covered three guys, and you know, all of them were uh, blown away. So uh, I think it's uh, about as big as you can hope for. Kayvon Thibodeau, number four overall prospect, Quarvis, uh, Qu- Quavar. Say it right, Michael. Since I can't do it, Quavaris. Boom, number one overall recruit. So Willie's got his eyes on, on the big-time right. guys and yeah. has obviously made a quick impression on them. Michael, man, we appreciate the knowledge as always, man. Take care. Absolutely. Michael Langston, recruiting analyst for Warchant.com. Joining us here on Wake Up Warchant. We'll wrap things up with a another look back on the spring game and our thoughts on the quarterback play right after this here on ESPN 97.9 Tallahassee. You're locked in to Wake Up Warchant on 97.9 ESPN Radio. Corey, you're looking at me all judgy. I feel, no. I feel very – my music, man. I just I wanted you – know, it's, it's a well, combination show. Trying to get people going for the morning. Yeah. The work day. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Wake up. It's Wake Up Board Chains. Corey Clark. I'm Aslan Hudjavani. Thanks so much for being here, folks. Show brought to you by For the Table Hospitality. Three awesome locations over in the College Town District. All right, let's get to it, Corey. Quarterbacks, right? Mm-hmm. James Blackman's team, after what happened with uh, DeAndre Francois over the weekend – and um, I guess you could maybe argue that Bailey Hockman outdueled them. Some people are trying to make that case. What, I would what not, do you think? I would what do you not think? make that argument. I, I thought Hockman made some nice plays. The throw to Matthews, the seventy-one yarder in the second half. I mean, that was a. I mean, that was a perfect throw. That was a bullet in between levels. I mean, it was just a great throw. Um, and he made another night. the The touchdown throw to Terry was really nice mm-hmm. when he moved to his left and threw kind of against his body. But no. I mean, look, he had he had DJ Matthews and Tamori and Terry. Now I know they weren't good enough to play at Florida State last year, but right. they've improved a lot. Uh-huh. He had them on his team, and he had Acres and Laborn. I mean, he had he, that's a that's that's the whole deal. It's hard to judge Blackman when I mean he had Gavin, but other than that, he had a guy that uh, had had was has been playing receiver for three weeks, and that guy had nine catches. Sheffield, he's a nice nice yeah. little player. So obviously, he doesn't have maybe the timing with these people that he that he probably has with Terry and Matthews. Who, who run with the first team a good bit. He didn't have a ton of time to throw. I don't think any, either quarterback was great. Um, Hockman, I mean, I guess he had better numbers because he had better receivers, but they both were hit about 50% of their passes. I wasn't, impre- I wasn't like blown away by Blackman. I don't think he played well, but I don't think Hockman was terrific either. I thought they both played admirable. They didn't throw, ter- they didn't throw interceptions. Uh, you know, I thought, they, I thought they both had okay games. But I think if you put Blackman on the Garnet team, we'd all been saying, wow, Blackman's, Blackman's really taking another step. Yeah, I mean, Willie was pretty measured after the game. He pointed out the fact that he was very proud of Bailey's effort because Bailey's had yeah. a foot injury, ankle injury that's been bothering him, but he went out there and competed really well. Um, moved you know, around on it pretty yeah. well. Yeah, and he pointed out that James was kind of let down a few times with some drops, and I was like, I don't really remember a lot of drops. But that's he had a couple of walk-on But drops. I did. I did. Yeah. I saw one from a walk-on. There was two that Deion. One was kind of high on Deontay Sheffield. One was kind of wide, but you'd hope that you'd make those catches on a Saturday. Um, so there was a couple other, there, there was, a, there's four that I count. I'm like, all right, well that, that kind of puts a little bit of damper and on no for running him. game. Right. Yeah. And I think the, the interesting thing was with the way the rules are where it's, you pretty much just get a hand on somebody and it's a, uh, and it's a, and it's a sack. Like that kind of equalizes all the pass rush. Even the guys on the interior have a really good chance of getting there and, and recording quote a sack. The Garnet team 
was all interior. So like Blackman was having Chris, Demarcus Christmas breathing down his neck. Like Cedric Wood played really Arthur well. Williams. Jalen Parks played really well. Yeah. Meanwhile, the white team had uh, the ends. They had they had Brian Burns. And yeah, Janaris Robinson. He was also on the Garnet team too. So like a lot of the the more physical imposing guys were the ones that were breathing down James Blackman's throat. So I think you know I think Hawkman had a better matchup. Plus uh, secondary wise, Garnet team which Blackman was going up against Stanford Samuels, Kyle Myers. Hampson Nasraldeen were all in that secondary. Right. And I think we assume that well, at least Taylor too, maybe I think. Or was he on the other team? I don't remember. But I would I would say that I think those guys I just rattled off, Levante Taylor was also on the Garnet team. I mean DeKalen was on the Garnet team. That's a lot of guys that we're assuming are going to start. Yeah. In either way, look, it, it it's it's not to say that he gets a pass. I, I mean he missed some throws, some just throws he needs to factor make. Factor these things in. But th- it's all it's all contextual. You gotta you gotta add Ooh. that's a nice word, right? I think that's three syllables. Solid. Uh, context uh, maybe four syllables. Um, I don't know many of those, but yeah, you you have to factor that in when you're judging quarterback play. That he didn't he wasn't throwing to the best receivers on the team. He didn't have the best running backs on the team, and he in his his the middle of his offensive line was giving him not a whole lot of time to throw. I will say this, man. Trey McKitty is an impressive mm-hmm. specimen, man. Mm-hmm. He can move. I don't remember a tight end like that around here in a good long while. That guy can really move. Um, and he had a he had a couple. I think he had a thirty seven yard and a twenty five yard that Blackman hit him with. But yeah, he just he, you know he, Blackman never got his really a rhythm. Uh, his Two catches cutting. for sixty yards for McKitty, yeah, thirty four nice. and then twenty six. Um, and so you know he Blackman never really got in a rhythm. I, I, don't, I honestly I didn't think Hockman got in a great rhythm either. He no. just had a couple of big plays, yeah. and he again he had the better receivers. That said, I don't think other than the Jameis the one Jameis miracle game. Um, but it wasn't a miracle because he was really good in it, and he turned out to be really good. But other than that, it's hard to really judge these quarterbacks in these spring games. It's yeah. just, again, it's hard. I think Blackman is the clear number one, maybe not from what we saw for those two hours. But, again, he's usually throwing to Terry and DJ Matthews. And uh, what what, J- what Jimbo did, I'm almost positive he did this in that, in that 13 spring game, he let different quarterbacks work with the number one offense. Yeah. So you saw Jameis with the number one offense. You saw Coker and you saw Trickett with it. That's a better way to judge, essentially, who the – and Willie's gotten to judge them over the course of the last month. Yeah. But if you're going to judge, that was the best way to do it for a spring game because obviously Jameis completely outplayed them using the same players. That that wasn't the case uh, on Saturday. But, I mean, I thought it was nice that Bailey Hockman looked like that. He yeah. had a nice game, and that's – again, that doesn't hurt anything. Nope. That's great to have a guy that you know can uh, – has got a little something to him, and he does, and he made some really good throws. Really good throws. I don't think he was – he certainly wasn't Jameis-like. No. It wasn't one of those debuts. But, he man, he made some really impressive throws, and that's good. Even if he's going to be your third-string guy, it looks to me like you've got a pretty talented third-string guy. Exactly. Just just more insurance at the quarterback position, which is never a bad thing, obviously, after what happened um, last season. Can we season. talk about that, too? About, oh, I thought you were going to say about Francois. Yeah, let's go back to that. I thought Willie handled that question perfectly. Um, he's still with our football team. You know, uh, DeAndre and I, we talked. Um, and like I told you guys, um, we're going to handle it internally, but he talked. Um, he understand uh, his responsibility as a student athlete here. Um, and he understand my expectations and what I'm looking for, uh, especially when it comes to our quarterback. You know, he's got to, he's got to be smart about who he's around and what he's around and, and make good decisions. Um, and I advise him to just make sure he's around his teammates all the time. That's revealing and it's and it's merciful and it and it's a it's a good big picture sort of look from the coach i feel oh i, I thought it, it's perfectly worded and it's we you know we we're he's not going to give us the uh blow by blow of what the punishment will be and and what the conversation he had with him but he gave us a he and it's not us it's not i'm not talking about the media i'm talking about the florida state fans that want to know what in the world is going on with their quarterback yep. and he's giving the he's talking to them and he you know he's using us as a conduit to them and he just handled it perfectly instead of saying it's an internal matter. I already told you guys I'm not talking about it. It's done. Yeah. He handled it perfectly in about a 30-second answer, and then everybody moved on. 
perfect way to handle it. Yeah, like, is it important to you? Is it not important to you? I mean, I think by him yes. letting us know that he's got a strategy behind this and he's got some really good advice and he's laying down expectations to to him. I mean, that that's the accountability. That's the, the other A word that everybody wants to know about. And that obviously. kid might be the star. And he, you know, I know he said especially for a quarterback, but you know, quarterbacks are a different. It's a whole different animal to be a starting quarterback in a place like Florida State or a quarterback in general. And this kid still can be the starting quarterback this season. He's not out of the running. Yeah, but the other two guys are pretty good. It's going to be a good problem. A log jam of talent in the entire backfield, running back and quarterback. I also want to get back to to Trey McKitty. I think we did you do you feel you got a good idea of what this offense can look like if it's going to to operate at a pretty high level come this season by what you saw on Saturday like a a feel for the philosophy or the principles they want to run? Yeah, I I did. I, obviously we know it's going to be fast and they want to hit a lot of big plays. You know, they must have thrown deep downfield on one-on-one situations eight times. Now they only completed maybe one of them. But they took some shots. Not counting what you were also pointing out in the press box, I thought that was a really good sort of observation, was the fact that those when the defense jumps early, it's not one of those, okay, let's just uh, reset. Yeah, I was going to say, so what they do is when they get the person to jump, when they get the defensive end to jump offside, they snap it, and the receiver to the nearest sideline just runs a go as fast as he can. And they took three shots with that. They hit one. Uh, for like a 20-yard gain, so they obviously declined the penalty. The other one they hit for a touchdown, but the play had been whistled dead because, I guess, unabated to the quarterback or whatever. But, man, that's awesome to see, too. Like, okay, this is a free play. Yeah. Let's make it look like a free play instead of taking a knee. Or, again, I probably will never stop. I may even stop apologizing for it. <laughs> the last guy's offense would let the guy jump back onside. So he was offside. He was a gentleman. He was a gentleman. Yes, but obviously Play with honor. the quarterback is like, no, no, you're supposed to be – get back to where you're supposed to be so I can read this defense. Yeah. i got about 12 more seconds before I'm snapping the ball. So that's not going to happen. When the guy jumps, they're snapping it, and they're going to take a shot. And you have some athletes that you can take some shots with. Yeah, they're, they're going to be a physical team up front, I feel like. And, you know, back to – you were talking about McKinney. McKinney's going to be a big deal. That that – Part and of the offense. Too, who didn't do much in the game. I don't even know if he had a catch, but no, I think he didn't. I think they're going to like him too. I saw him block pretty well on a couple of runs that you know, um, you know, guys like you know LeBorn and Cam were able to profit off of. I like the little thing they ran. I thought it was so nice. And if, if Derek Kelly didn't get knocked back and, and Cam Akers, Cam Akers, well, he walks in. Yeah, it was awesome. He was the actually Cam. the shotgun, and then Hawkman just takes one step to his right. Akers takes one step to his right. And is now under center or behind center, rather, takes a snap and would have been, I mean, just little things like that. It's like, oh, that's so refreshing. But that tight end position, I think of, of all the things that people talk about in terms of the talent that Willie Taggart's had at, you know, South Florida or Oregon, probably the one biggest discrepancy, I would say, is like that H-back tight end spot. I don't think there's anybody like Trey McKitty at USF. I don't think there's anybody like Trey McKitty at Oregon. So I feel like when they, they, they exploit that hole down the seam or they'll do like a, just a short drag route, that sort of stuff over the middle of the field. I think James has got to get comfortable with that because I think James likes going outside around the numbers in the sideline because if it's a, an incomplete pass, it's probably going to be out of bounds. But when right. you start throwing stuff over the middle and it gets tipped, or that's you're more susceptible to turning the ball over. But that part of the offense where they, they'll hold the ball out, they'll hold and the, the handoff, I think it, it might back. be an RPO. I don't know if that's yes. a, a read thing or if, yeah. it's a, if it's actual design play to make it look like you're running. It looks like an RPO to I me. I feel like it is. Because he throws it so quickly yep. as if he doesn't want the lineman to get downfield too fast. But um, those plays, those, you know, they also got a couple that were batted in the air. and That's the yep. risk with them. Mm -hmm. But you also hit 60 yards on two plays. I want to ask you before we go, do you think of the, the ones I've coined, here McKitty Kitty, or LeBorn to run. That's the best. Which do you think LeBorn to run? LeBorn to run is awesome. Right. LeBorn to run is fantastic. I feel like he gave himself his own nickname. It's not you, you went with his with his Hit post game buff. interview. Yeah, I Hit think that, that anytime he has a big run, that's what everybody's going to tweet yeah. out now. They're not going to think of LeBorn to run. Well, I'm actually a little bit worried. I've, I heard the commentators actually call him LeBorn, like not La Laburn. La they call him Labor, not LeBorn. They call him Laburn. Oh. So I'm a little bit nervous. Like, Laborn to run? That doesn't No, it doesn't happen? at all. No, he's Laborn. We're calling him Laborn. I don't know what his mama calls him, <laughs> but we're we're calling him Laborn. And Ira overruled us in the Champions Club on Saturday at the meet and greet when we called Jock Patrick Jock. He's like, it's Jockez. Well, that's what they call him. That's what his parents and everybody calls him. <laughs> but I'm I'm going against my trend. When you spell your name like that, man, it's a French name. You're gonna be called Jacques. Yeah. That's how it is. Jacques Patrick. And again, it was really cool to see everybody up at the Champions Club, all, all the subscribers. That was super cool. Uh, that was fun. That was no. a neat little event. We should, I hope we do that in the fall at some point, too. Yeah. And also, I was at the uh, the Palace Saloon. That place is still up. 
and Smokey's all get out. Got to meet two fans of the program. They're actually from the Atlanta area, Corey. So I think if you're ever up, you know, when you're back in your, your hometown, um, you know, you can say what's up to them. But they were um, they were trying to like they they want they want Tinder Thursday because they're like, yeah, I know you're worried about what you guys are going to talk about now. The spring football is over. Oh, we're definitely going back. So to Tinder. They were Tuesdays. actually trying to like they were trying to like hook me up with people at the at the bar. I'm like, no, please stop doing this. I'm like, not here at the Palace. Like maybe go to Pop Belly so you guys can help me out. <laughs> well, of yeah. course, that's more your age range. Yeah. They're not subscribers, so I shouldn't shout them out. But their names are Chris and Ivy. Ivy, open up the pocketbook. Let Chris subscribe to War Chan. He wants I to mean, do it. Corey Clark, Ira. And Aslan are all working for Warchant.com. How can you not go to that site? I know. Corey, good stuff out of you, man. Uh, no spring, spring was fun. We'll talk about baseball. Hopefully they'll get back on oh, their winning boy, ways. It was not. a five-game five, five, game five in a row. Um, only one way to go, and that's up for them. And uh, only one way to go for the rest of the week, and that's uh, smoothly for everybody, we hope. He's Corey Maslow. Thanks for listening, folks. We'll catch up with you later. Jeff Cameron coming up at 3. Warchant.com is the ultimate inside source for FSU football and recruiting. And now you can get in on the action for free for an entire month. Warchant.com is offering a risk-free 30-day trial subscription. Get full access to the number one website covering the Seminoles just by entering the promo code WARCHANT30. That's WARCHANT30. Sign up and get in on the world's most active FSU message boards. Receive breaking news, stories from our award-winning staff, plus get exclusive interviews and videos. Just enter the promo code WARCHANT30. WARCHANT.com, your ultimate Seminole sports source.